Although mid-July is here and we're in the midst of the salmon run, there are still amorous brown bears on the landscape. Bear courtship can include long walks on the beach, sometimes a stroll in the forest. It provides a bear with the opportunity or a pair of bears the opportunity to get to know one another. Yet it definitely does not include any serenades or gifts. And during this live broadcast today, we'll explore the brown bear mating season. Of course, the ultimate end result of the bear's efforts is a new litter of cubs. But this is a season marked by competition, adaptation, communication, and risk. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with Explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to this live broadcast brought to you by, of course, Explore.org, the Katmai Conservancy and Katmai National Park. Joining me today is my co-host, Ranger Kim Grossman from Katmai National Park. Ranger Kim, thanks so much for joining me today. Uh, where are you hanging out right now? Hi, uh, thanks for having me. We're down over here at the lower river. Um, you might see some bears pop in behind <laughs> in the background. So just keep an eye out for them as well. <laughs> Looks like a great day there. Certainly a more pleasant day to be outside than yesterday in that rain. And Kim and I have a lot of ground to cover about this topic, but if you have questions about bear courtship uh, and the biology of their reproductive cycle, please drop those questions in the comments and we'll do our best to try to answer them, uh, at least a few of them during the broadcast. Uh, Kim, uh, the, you know, June is the, the peak of the bear mating season. Uh, so it, even though we're in July right now, it's not too late in the year to see courtship uh, behavior between bears. Well before that begins, however, female bears experience a fairly dramatic change in their bodies. So what is happening like maybe right before the mating season begins? That's right, Mike. July is still the time for copulating and populating for brown bears here in Katmai. Uh, female bears experience a full swing of hormones at this time. Um, and bears have a similarity to humans in the respect that sexual maturity is not a formulaic principle. Um, on average, females reach maturity around five years old, uh, give or take a couple of years. Um, once these sub-adults transition into adult sows, they can expect to go through estrus. And what is estrus? Uh, it's a period of time when a female mammal is receptive and able to conceive. Um, during this time, they may have several cycles, each lasting about maybe 10 to 30 days, but then that's it. They have this short window of only three months per year to mate. And on top of that, they only allow males to mount during the three to four peak days of their cycle. So bears are already these highly solitary creatures. And can you imagine just how tricky this must be to get the timing of all of this right? Um, so for this reason, uh, boars will travel far from their home ranges during the breeding season to seize the opportunities of passing on uh, genetic material, uh, following their noses along the way. Um, see, so estrus gives a sow an altered smell. Think of it kind of like um, a genetically tantalizing perfume. Um, it kind of like reels in the boars, sort of like pheromones. Um, sex hormones in bears are actually disposed from their bodies through urination. So males can um, track receptiveness of a female when they're sniffing the soil and the grasses where she has traveled and where she has urinated. Um, at Katmai, we see bears only spending a short while together after copulation is over. Um, because we've seen litters where uh, several of the little cubs were sired from the same male, um, it would lead us to believe that sows can release uh, multiple ovums during that individual session with one boar. Um, so this is all assuming, all of these hormones are assuming that the female bear is um, currently without cubs. Um, though it is uncommon for brown bears at Katmai to separate from their cubs for at least two summers, we have seen some exceptions, um, like with uh, 402 back in 2014. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with her storyline, uh, she was pursued by 856 um, despite having a yearling at the time. So this is not typical behavior unless a male is trying to mate or attack. 
Um, ultimately, in 2014, 402 did separate from her cub completely. Um, the reason for his early emancipation was because of the onset of 402's estrus, again, the hormones that uh, bears are experiencing right now. Um, so the laws of nature, they're not always written in stone, um, but sometimes we see an example and it just doesn't make sense to us, but it does make a lot of sense in the world of bears. Um, we do see how estrus magnetically draws the bears towards each other, especially during the season. But can you tell us what it looks like when the bears finally meet? Yeah, courtship it, between bears is uh, kind of a straightforward process. A male locks in on, on the scent of an estrus female, as you described, and he really kind of begins a, a slow pursuit. He'll follow her with a nearly single-minded purpose, even if she tries to evade him. And I like this clip here because it's a pretty good example of just how persistent male bears will be. This is from our Dumpling Mountain Cam. Uh, female on the left walking away and uh, a an amorous male behind her, but he's actually injured. Uh, we don't know why, we don't know how, but he's hobbled obviously, yet that doesn't stop him from pursuing that mating opportunity. And a female might try to evade uh, a male if she's not really comfortable with his presence, but she usually can't because he can follow her scent trail even when she is out of sight. The male is waiting for her to become receptive to his advances. In a way, uh, the female has to habituate to him most of the time, the male bear can pose a, like a physical threat to smaller bears. So often the female is wary of her suitor, but over time they get used to one another. Uh, on rare occasions, bears meet and they can copulate almost immediately. But usually courtship is a drawn out process, at least over several days and sometimes over uh, almost two weeks. And in a, in a moment, Kim will introduce the female perspective on this process. Right now, though, I want to take a closer look at courtship and motivation from a male bear's perspective. To ensure his reproductive success, a male bear often experiences a great deal of competition. And when we watch the, the behavior of male bears during the mating season, we should almost always consider a couple of things. There's always like two things to keep in mind when you're thinking about the motivation of a male bear. Um, mating opportunities are limited for male bears. And number two, they don't help raise cubs. For a male brown bear, that means reproductive success is based solely on the number of offspring he can sire. And these facts create a great deal of conflict among male bears for mating opportunities. And, and it can even influence the evolution of their body size. Now, before we get into some of the specifics on bears, uh, I wanna con contrast the behavior of bears with a couple of examples from other species. Some kind of like classic examples of the ways males can establish access to females when uh, when they're looking for reproductive opportunities. Uh, just two that um, are easy to think of and a lot of people I think are familiar with, but that's a peafowl and wild turkey. These are species uh, where the combination of showmanship and flamboyance and also physical endurance when they're displaying, all of those things showcase a male's reproductive fitness. And they're doing that, they're displaying their feathers, for example, uh, because they're ornaments. Uh, the female, their female counterparts are extremely choosy decorative feathers uh, and the way they display them really demonstrate fitness to the females. In contrast to those animals, there's uh, males of certain species of birds uh, and mammals that are uh, territorial uh, and that can allow them to gain greater access to mating opportunities as well. You can consider a bird like a robin. Male robins use song to defend their nesting territories and they'll drive away competing males from that space. Song can also attract females into their nesting territory. Uh, among mammals, elephant seals pro provide a really clear example how defending territory can pay big dividends. Male elephant seals like these in Point Reyes National Seashore establish and defend territory on beaches where females arrive to give birth and mate as they wean their pups. So large bulls with the most stamina, the, who are best able to defend those territories on the beach, secure the most mating opportunities. And I bring these examples into the conversation so we can compare them with the adaptive fitness of male brown bears. We won't find male bears displaying for females or, or defending specific territories, but they compete in their own ways. So again, go back to the two things that really exert a strong influence on males during the mating season, limited mating opportunities, and males play no role in raising offspring. Female bears devote a tremendous amount of energy into raising cubs, but males are not taxed with that energetic burden. 
So in a sense, to put it really, maybe crudely, a sperm is really cheap. It doesn't take a lot of energy to produce sperm. It takes a lot of energy though to raise cubs. So if you're a really big bear, then you're probably um, you know, able to devote more energy into building body mass versus like a, a, a mother bear who has to devote a lot of energy from her, from her body into protecting her cubs and raising her cubs. And that's one reason why male bears are so much larger. And body size matters in the bear world. Greater body size provides bears with a competitive advantage in the mating game. You're a big bear. You're able to, to more successfully defend your access to a female uh, who's in estrus. And that's probably selected for traits that promote large body size in male bears. And that's why the largest male bears in the park right now um, are pushing 1,000 pounds. And the average midsummer weight of males in this season is uh, in the middle of summer, seven to 900 pounds. So these are some of the biggest bears in the world. They're also experiencing like super high levels of t testosterone right now. It's just kind of like off the charts for them at the, at the maximum level it will be for the year. And they only have one shot often at a, a mating opportunity. Males can't count on another. So persistence, stamina, those are assets. Defensiveness and possessiveness of those mating opportunities are assets as well. He's got to defend access to the female who uh, for the whole time he follows her. Otherwise, a male, another male might displace him. Male bears you know, they, they put in a lot of work to court females, but uh, Cam, male bears are only half of the equation. So what's going on from the, pem the, the, the female perspective um, during the mating season? <laughs> so rule number one is mostly for females, play hard to get. And as silly as that sounds, we see a familiar behavior displayed by our cat mouth cat my brown bears. Um, it could be weeks of courting before female acquiesces to a male's proposal, as you had mentioned. Um, during this time, she is assessing if the uh, boar's behavior is aggressive. Um, we saw a similar dance between 856 and 901 this season um, and their courtship. 856 is one of the most dominant males and he has retained this title for a decade so he's got quite a reputation around here um odds are great for a bear of you know a five six stature to find opportunities to mate um female bears they tend to be more attracted to bigger more dominant bears um whether this is out of preference or you know just the way the cards are stacked um it's really hard to say. Uh, this is kind of why younger males don't always get opportunities to mate their first couple of years into uh, sexual maturity, because um, you know dominant bears get first dibs. <laughs> um, the ladies wanting the best survival uh, for their offspring, they might find it sooner with strong genetic genes, but. All bears are promiscuous and are open to mating with multiple partners. So it's absolutely possible for a single litter to have multiple fathers. Um, though there is no DNA evidence uh, here at Brooks to determine uh, the genealogy, we do know that the possibilities and the realities of these do exist. Um, yeah, we do see some bears copulating with some of their prior partners. Um, again, like 856 and 402, um, who they just keep seeming to find each other um, for the last couple years. So um, we also saw uh, 435 Molly emancipate her cub this summer, and she re-entered estrus. Uh, she then mated with a younger, unidentified male, and many viewers were puzzled by this, and they asked why why wouldn't 435 mate with a more mature male? <laughs> so for one, you know, 435, she's she's around her mid-20s right now. So this makes her one of our oldest bears to use Brooks River. Um, so in comparison, most bears are going to be younger than her. <laughs> so yeah, so she mated with a younger boar. Um, secondly, it's a great question. Um, what it comes down to really is we don't know why bears make the choices that they do. Um, perhaps it was just the right timing. Um, other than alternative competitors uh, that vie for a sound's attention, a female is likely to accept opportunities that are handed to her. Um, so Mike, bears, they can't tell us 
why they're doing the things that they're doing. They don't use words like us humans to communicate, but we do know that they have other ways of expressing themselves. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. You know, one of the ways that we see bears communicating with one another is through their marking behavior. They'll, they'll use a variety of postures and, 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 and grunts and growls and things like that to, to say what's up. Um, but marking behavior uh, is something that we see uh, quite a bit during the mating season. And that, uh, it, it may not seem like it at first, but it's really like a form of, of communication. So as A56 walks away from one of his uh, rivals here, 747, we'll see him marking a tree on the island downstream of Brooks Falls. And I took this video a few years ago, so the island looks a little bit different. But bears mark their presence in a landscape by rubbing on objects like trees or rocks. And another marking behavior that you'll see, and I think A56 might do this after he's done rubbing on the tree, is um, cowboy walking. So that's uh, a, an exaggerated stiff-legged gait when the bears grind their foot pads into the ground. Why they do that, though, again, that's sort of an open question. There are three hypotheses on marking, although they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, they will do it to, I think, sometimes to scratch an itch. So sometimes they are itchy, and I think they do it just because it feels good to, to rub some skin on a, on a rock, for example, or a tree. The other two ideas, though, have to do more with communication. Bears have an extremely powerful sense of smell. We've mentioned that already several times in, in our chat here. And they can infer a lot about other, other bears from, from their scent alone. A second hypothesis uh, is, is that scent marking can convey info about a bear's individual condition or genetic quality. And a third is it can function to signal mates during the mating season. So this tree is just all beat up with bear fur, uh, probably bits of skin on there. There's urine on the ground a lot of times next to these trees as well. Uh, so they are marking trees, it seems like, to, uh, to signal fitness and maybe uh, provide signals to uh, potential mates during the mating season. And there's some scientific evidence for this as well. Uh, in 2017, there's a, a study that was published that found that male brown bears rub up uh, about 60% more during the breeding season than, than the non-breeding season. So it seems like they're trying to say, Hi, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, you know, um, I'm, I'm available to go on, on dates if you, if you need me to. Uh, but females, on the other hand, in that same study, were uh, didn't have any sort of seasonal trends in the, the amount of time where they were marking trees. And then there was a 2021 study uh, from uh, southwest Alberta and southeast British Columbia and northwest Montana. So sort of like the region right around Glacier National Park in Montana, just a little bit north. And that study found through DNA analysis that adult bears who mark trees more often are more reproductively successful. So they found that by taking... Um, samples, hair samples from marking sites around the area, genotyping and, and analyzing the DNA of that. They also had DNA from maybe over, I think if I rem, uh, look at the stats correctly, over 2000 bears in the area. So they were able to determine uh, parentage, but they took the, the research a bit further and they wanted to see if there was a correlation between the number of rubbing events on trees or rocks and the number of mates they found that the number of mates for a bear increased with the number of rub objects at which an individual was detected. Uh, and there's a similar relationship uh, detected among uh, female bears. So in some, there seems to be a positive, positive relationship between rubbing on a tree, for instance, or another object and mating success. Now, what, whether that has to do something more with like the dominance or the individual fitness level of the bear, I think, again, that's still an open question. But it works through scent glands on their feet and their back. The bears have anal glands as well. Urine carries scent and chemical signatures too. So when you're watching a bear mark a tree, keep in mind that it is sometimes just to scratch an itch. But it also provides uh, important information that we maybe don't have the ability to understand, but certainly bears can. And can marking behavior and is it? You know, it's a behavioral adaptation, it's a physical adaptation, and it seems to play an important role during the mating season. Let's say, though, that everything works out. You know, uh, mating happens, eggs are fertilized. What's uh, next for the female bear? Great question. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we did see 435 Holly separate from her cub this summer, and then so it, an entirely new cycle begins. Um, what's happening in her body now? 
that she has copulated. Let's let's talk about that. Um, we've we've begun to see just you know how complex the courting system is with brown bears um, because of their solitary nature. Um, perhaps because of this, bears have developed induced ovulation um, upon stimulation. So this this will allow a fertile egg uh, to be released right before copulation. So the egg is kind of at its prime for fertilization. Uh, once fertilized, the egg then begins to divide, but the embryo doesn't implant itself just yet. Um, no, it does not. Um, so this is actually where delayed implantation comes into play. It allows a bear's pregnancy to occur at um, the most advantageous time, really. Um, all of the fertilized eggs will actually implant themselves at the same time. So cool. Um, once the female, uh, when she enters her den for hibernation in um, October or November. So instead of implanting in the uterus right away, um, bears can continue focusing in the fall on accumulating calories necessary to survive hibernation. And then therefore, you know, any extra reserves can then be strictly designated to sustaining a pregnancy. Love this. So similar to kind of like when you're on a plane, right? So they always tell you to put your oxygen mask on before you help others. So that way you can help aid the cause. Um, that's going to be the similar thing about bears. They need to use the calories to um, buy for their survival and anything else can be to aid the cause of making baby bears. Um, so if um, a sow has less than 25% body fat reserves, um, she actually won't be able to sustain her pregnancy. Um, the sow's body also determines how many eggs can be implanted based on her caloric reserves. So once it decides and they implant themselves, eight weeks later, we get these several one pound little cubs are born. <laughs> um, though two in a litter is about common for most bears here. Um, we do see larger families sometimes, um, like 94 um, this summer with her four cubs. Um, and these cubs, they'll stay with their mom for about two and a half years. So in theory, females can breed about every three years. And, you know, with an average lifespan of like 20 years, that makes only about 10 bears. So by comparison, herding animals who live within very close proximity to one another, um, they could produce way more offspring, more than like 1400 descendants in 10 years. So um, delayed implantation, it's an absolutely excellent strategy bears use for uh, survival. Um, but you know, there are also many risks the cubs will face once they are born. Uh, can you tell us more about the risks of the mating season in general, Mike? For sure. And, and actually, one of the questions that came in was about 94 and her four cubs. Somebody was wondering, how common is it for sows to have four cubs? And within my experience at Brooks River and going back and looking at the bear monitoring records there, it's, it's pretty uncommon. We see it every few years, but the average litter size of, uh, of bears in Katmai is two to three. So we don't see it happen all that often, but every few years, especially when a female is really well fed, now, it's an extremely difficult task for a mother bear to raise all four of those cubs to weaning. Uh, I've never seen that happen at Brooks River, at least as far as I know, it's never been documented to happen at Brooks River. Sometimes a mother bear will get really close uh, to keeping all four of her cubs towards the, for the end of the summer, for example, but usually she hasn't been able to keep uh, or protect all of those cubs through like the two to three summers that are necessary. And, you know, there's a variety of risks that cubs face, but if there's one so-called fact that people have heard about uh, bears, it's that males can kill cubs. This definitely happens. And although, you know, explaining it and understanding why it happens, that's a different story. It seems maladaptive, really, from the perspective of the species. Why would you want to kill a cub that, you know, is a fellow member of your, your, um, your species? 
So we're, you know, we're talking about it now uh, because perhaps the most common hypothesis to explain it is something called sexually selected infanticide. And that, simply put, is a male mating strategy in which males kill unrelated dependent offspring to increase their own opportunities to sire offspring. It happens in many different types of mammals. So it's probably evolved independently a bunch of different times because it happens in hares, happens in shrews, at least one species of bat it's been documented in. Um, it's famously uh, documented in lions, uh, many species of primates as well. It's even been documented in dolphins and horses from, from what I have read. And there is some evidence for that in brown bears because most documented cases of infanticide have occurred during the mating season. And importantly, female bears can start their estrus cycle within a few days of losing their litter of cubs. Just last Friday, in fact, we witnessed an attempted infanticide at Brooks Falls. And I'm not gonna revisit that whole event, uh, but a word of warning, we will show that kind of like the last moments or so of it. You won't see any cubs getting hurt, but there is a fight and a chase. And if you want a full breakdown of that situation, I hosted an impromptu Q&A about it last Friday, and you can find that on explore.org Bears and Bison YouTube channel. So for context, to, just to set this video up, um, in the video, a mother bear, number 39, charged a large adult male, number 856, who was walking near her cubs. They engaged in a pretty violent fight. 39's cubs ran away, and then the fight breaks off. But that's not the end of it, and I think that's where we're uh, planning to pick up the video uh, right now. Now, we don't know the fate of this family. I want to say that uh, right off the bat, but this is 856 and 39. 856 in the foreground, 39 in the background. So 856 is targeting, it looks like, the cubs at this moment. 39 is still not done defending her cubs. They're somewhere on the near bank, so they go off into the forest uh, as our camera operator follows the action. A very complicated situation. Bears all over the place, cubs all over the place. And we'll see uh, the a uh, couple of cubs running by. We'll see 856. Uh, running by and actually one of the cubs will come right towards the camera here in just a second of course yeah we don't know the fate of this family we don't know if a56 actually killed any of the cubs or not and rangers haven't seen them at the river since so keep a, an eye out for them we uh you know the rangers are looking um we're also looking on the cameras and here comes a56 right now in pursuit of um one of those cubs that's going to be sprinting right by at, at this point in time 856 he he stops he can he stops his pursuit at least momentarily and i think that's just because he's gassed he is just out of breath at this point a lot of fighting a lot of running around for him he's a big dude really big brown bears tend to overheat very quickly they can sprint very fast so never try to outrun a bear because you're not gonna be able to do it but they do tend to get overheated pretty quickly so he kind of breaks off the chase at that moment uh, and this was a situation where 856 he, he seemed clearly intent on chasing the cubs but I'm not sure that his original motivation was to kill the cubs. And the more I think about it, the less I think he was motivated by something like sexually selected infanticide in this situation. The, the situation just seems so spontaneous. And when he first approached the area where the family was standing, mom was already on edge. She was already feeling really defensive and he didn't look interested in them. You know, of course I could be reading his behavior incorrectly, but to me, it really looked like 856 continued the chase, maybe because, and I thought about this more, but maybe because he was motivated to express and assert his dominance. Something switched in his attitude after he was charged by 39, the mother bear. 856 is an extremely dominant bear, so perhaps his pursuit of the cubs had nothing to do with future mating opportunities and much to do with him reaffirming his dominance. Again, that's a hypothesis I have. It's not proven in fact, but no matter what, uh, you know, if I'm six in this situation, I don't think sexually selected infanticide was his motivation. Although that is probably the case with certain bears in certain situations. Uh, so bears can be very dangerous for cubs. That's the bottom line is that. And Cam, defensiveness is one way that mother bears can provide for their cubs and protect them, but that's maybe not the only way. They may have some uh, some other uh, tricks uh, up their sleeve. Yeah, yeah, um, they do. <laughs> Mother bears have some tricks up their sleeve for sure. Um, so the goal, right, is to make more bears, as you were mentioning. Um, so while these boars have succeeded, you know, already in spreading their genetic material, the real work of protecting and raising the offspring with the best chances of survival, you know, begins. 
Um, and a few ways that our female bears will shield uh, cubs from the dangers of other bears come in many forms. Um, we do see females and their cubs changing habits, you know, in order to avoid fishing areas where they may run into more dominant males, such as, you know, our falls. Um, already this season, uh, we have seen many small families fishing downstream um, here at the lower river where I'm standing. Um, and that way um, down here, they can keep their distance and have a good line of sight. Um, they will also alter their fishing style sometimes. Um, you know, when they have these small families to protect, uh, like 94 with her cubs. Um, in the past, when she was a single bear, uh, I did see her often fishing over at the falls, but this year she has kept her distance. And again, we've seen her mostly down here with her with her four little cubs. Um, some families, you know, they'll even refrain from traveling the river at all for a season. All the cubs are still in the tree. Um, it's just too much danger. Um, because we live in such a unique place, bears, they'll actually use us as humans. Um, so they go to these populated areas you know, where we all live. And they know they should have some sort of protection. Um, we don't intervene within bear interactions, but there are just, there are human elements and that can help dissuade, you know, bears from coming into camp. So it makes it a safer choice for younger families to come because the other bears aren't. Um, then we also see some bears who, who are downright defensive. And I think we know that we're talking about 128 grazer. <laughs> um, highly aggressive mother, um, very protective. Um, she has taken her cubs to the falls in the past and taught them how to fish on the live with her, which is very, very, you know, brave. Um, and we've also seen her, <laughs> we've also even seen her pushing other bears off <laughs> the falls who get too close to her and her baby. <laughs> so, you know, that is also um, one way to help protect them. Um, there's no singular right way to protect your family, right? Um, so we see success. We also see failure in every one of these approaches. Um, but, you know, one theory also um, that we speculate of way bear to their offspring um, is actually part of the conception of them. Um, it's this theory of siring several different fathers for your singular litter so that way you confuse the paternity and then that way it protects the offspring. As you were saying before, why would you know a boar want to get rid of you know one of his offspring? So if they have different fathers for litter, who knows which bears belong to who? After all, you know, isn't the point of all of this to pass on genetics, right? So we've talked about theories, you know, in support of sexually selected infanticide. But can you tell us more about some of the evidence against it as well? For sure. There's, you know, there's certainly evidence against sexually selected infanticide, that theory in brown bears, because not all cubs are killed uh, by males. Not all cubs are killed during the mating season. Uh, it's also, it, it's extremely rare, but female bears have been documented to kill cubs too. So the behavior, uh, you know, maybe extends across a wide number of bears. It's not restricted to just males. And the studies that I have read haven't found evidence that a male bear who kills a cub is more reproductively successful. I think that's an open question right now that I, I would like to see if scientists can somehow figure out in the near future. Uh, it, you know, like I mentioned before, sometimes cubs are not specifically targeted by males, but they're killed in an accident of circumstance. We've seen that happen at Brooks, Brooks River. Bears also are conditioned to chase small furry things. Cubs can look like small furry things. If you run away from a, a bear and you're a small furry thing, a bear might give chase. Although I'm sure that bears are smart enough to differentiate between something that's like a ground squirrel and a bear cub. So they can make those, those determinations as well. In some, there's really no clear cut answer on this um, behavior. Sometimes infanticide might be driven by need to mate or the, the want to mate, but that's clearly not true in all cases. Um, it happens often enough though, it's, and it's been going on long enough 
to influence the behavior of female bears. So the risk to her cubs is real, and that's why we see female bears behaving in certain ways during the mating season and after the mating season. Uh, one final thought on this, though, uh, before we get to some viewer questions. Uh, infanticide is certainly a difficult event to witness. It's going to provoke strong emotions. And I think, you know, if any any of you watched the, the live footage of 39 and 856 the other day, and, you know, you had some really strong visceral reactions to it, that, that's okay. I think that's kind of normal. Uh, it's, it's a difficult situation to watch. Uh, so there's nothing wrong with feeling empathy for bears. And I think we should. Um, the thing that we really need to consider when we see these events, though, is um, that we should, we should try very strongly to avoid judging the behavior of bears based on standards of human ethics and morals. And I've said that before. I'll say it again. I'm saying it right now. I just think it's a really important point to consider because bears are, are bears, right? They're not people. So if we can uh, you know, avoid judging them based on what we think is right and wrong, then I think we can truly expand our empathy to include all bears. And that will help us uh, to protect the habitats and the space uh, uh, that they need to survive and their, their needs overall. Kim, I, we have given people a lot to consider over the last um, you know, 40 minutes or so, but we got a lot of questions too. Do you want to try to, to get to some questions quickly before we call tonight? Oh, did my internet freeze? All right, maybe we lost Kim. Maybe we didn't. Maybe it's my internet. I'm going to wait for just a moment here um, for her to come back. Uh, but I do want to get to some viewer questions. Okay, so we did lose Kim for just a moment here. Um, so thanks for our production staff for informing me of that. She's logging back in right now. So we're gonna try to get to a few viewer questions here in the last remaining moments. Kim, thanks for standing by. Thanks for um, uh, hanging hanging out with us and getting through those, um, those technical issues. It's, it's a lot to juggle. Um, we had a bunch of questions come in early in the chat, and we'll get to some of those. We'll try to get to some of the ones that have come in more recently. Uh, somebody is wondering about um, male bears and how many times per season do do a bear, for example, expect uh, to 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 mate. Um, that's a that's an interesting question. I think a lot of times they can maybe just count on a couple. Um, at most, if you're a very dominant male bear. And, you know, we, when we were um, going through sort of our outline a couple of days ago, Kim, we were talking about how, uh, you know, a male bear can really only defend access to one female at a time. It's not like a, a lek, for example, that you would find with elephant seals or with uh, 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 a sage grouse, you know, something like that, where like there's a, there's, a, you know, a bunch of females all in the same area. It's not like that at all. It really does seem like, and maybe you've observed this this year, it seems like like a bear like A56, for example, he's really kind of like focused on one female at a time. So I don't think he gets to mate that all that often, even for the real big dominant bears. Yeah, it's, it seemed like once he narrowed in his focus on one female, he pursued her until he was successful. So, you know, that, that seems to be the general um, pattern that we've been seeing here is, yeah, they will find a mate and they will pursue her. So maybe other opportunities will be handed to other bears um, that are not in pursuit. And uh, another question, um, and this is one that, that comes up commonly because I think people are very curious about, um, you know, bears at, at the river. We see multiple generations of bears coming back, mothers and sisters. We see mothers and sons, for instance. If somebody is wondering, do bears know not to mate? with relatives like their mothers and sisters, for instance. Uh, I, don't, I don't think they have really like any sort of uh, taboos against that. Um, you know, if, if it came to it, yeah, probably they could. And there's been um, some DNA evidence uh, gathered that, that found, at least at Brooks River, um, one litter of cubs being uh, with a male uh, father, he actually mated with his, his uh, female, one of his female offspring and produced a litter. So that can happen uh, for sure, just like it can happen in like domestic dogs, for instance. So again, I don't think they have a taboo against that. But one of the things that's interesting about brown bears overall is how the juveniles will disperse, uh, maybe away from mother's um, you know, home range. A, a male um, subadult bear is much more likely to, to go way off in the distance and establish a, a new home range that doesn't really overlap 
much with with mom or his sisters, for instance. Uh, although um, a female subadult bear is much more likely to establish a home range that overlaps with mom. So uh, in that sense, I think you know male bears are just kind of like moving far and wide, um, and that helps to reduce uh, the overall um, chances of of um, of inbreeding amongst amongst bears. And, you know, Kim, from what you've observed, you know, looking, being at the river this year, um, what about dominant male bears? Uh, you know, when they are pursuing a female, how much time, you know, are they actually focused on eating? That's a question. Do dominant boars eat more when they're, when they smell females in estrus? Oh, that is, that is a great question. You know, from, from what I've seen, they've seemed very focused on the females and, you know, again, make it, making those babies. Um, and, you know, the thing is, we saw a lot of bears a little bit earlier in the season as well, you know, before the salmon started um, really to like multiply down over here in the rivers. So it, it was probably really good timing for them to focus on their mating opportunities then. And then now they can start to use um, their feeding opportunities for hibernation. So, um, yeah, now that the salmon has been up and running and it, most of our bears have been focusing their attention on that. And a lot of us were surprised actually that one two eight grazer uh, kept her cubs this year because she didn't do that with her previous litter. She actually had separated from them when they were at this age. So if you're unfamiliar with this family, uh, her cubs this year are two and a half years old. So they're in their third summer. Her first litter though, she only kept for two summers. And that was a, a little bit of a surprise for uh, us to see that she kept her cub for this, uh, these cubs for this uh, additional summer. Um, and somebody was wondering, is it, um, do you suppose that Grazer did not go into estrus this season? And is that why she kept her cubs? I certainly think that's the case. Like she did not experience that estrus cycle for whatever reason. That's an unconscious decision by, um, by a female bear. You know, she's just not thinking like, hey, now's the time. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's dictated by her body unconsciously. So I'm not sure what it means for her or her cubs necessarily. It's probably a great advantage to her with her cubs. Uh, but Kim, you were you were talking about earlier in the broadcast how you know over a course of a bear's lifetime they can only have so many litters. So keeping you know uh, a litter of of cubs for an extra year actually reduce may reduce Grazer's overall uh, lifetime uh, output of cubs her, her overall fecundity. What do you what do you think about uh, that topic? Well, right. I mean, yeah, it may reduce you know the amount of bears that she's able to produce in her lifetime but it also gives her cubs a better chance of survival so you know if, if you release or if the bears release their cubs earlier um, and these bears are on their own then they have to fend those against other bears finding resources etc so um, this actually could be um, a strategy to you know make sure that more bears are actually surviving with their genetics Absolutely. Yeah. There's, it's, you know, each, each one of the bears is like uh, the mother bears are kind of like juggling that decision again, unconsciously. I can have more cubs and I could maybe give them less parental care over just two seasons, or I could have fewer cubs over my lifetime and give them more parental care and maybe, you know, set them up for greater survival, um, you know, going forward. So that's again, a, maybe a, uh, an unanswered question in the bear world. Uh, Kim, you were also talking about and some of the information you presented about, um, you know, delayed implantation and how body fat really kind of matters to the um, to the female bear when she goes into her den. Somebody was wondering uh, what causes a bear to have multiple cubs in a litter, let's say two cubs or three cubs or even four cubs. So can you talk once again about sort of how body fat might um, affect a female's reproductive success? Yeah. So, you know, I, I made that analogy earlier about being in an airplane with your with your mask, right? So a bear, you know, can't care for other cubs if she can't care for herself first. Um, so any of the fat reserves from, you know, the salmon run this season are going to go to her body first. And then her body is just going to go ahead and it's going to determine, hey, how much do I have left um, to support any other pregnancies? Um, and then from there, it'll decide, like, 
one egg, two eggs, you know, how many ever, um, and they will implant themselves and, you know, she will give birth to that many bears. But it just, it's just the body knows um, how to survive. So it's just trying to make sure that she can survive and support the cubs and anything else. Well, then we get to see a whole bunch of cute cubs <laughs> appear in the springtime. So lucky for us too. <laughs> Yeah, certainly body fat is extremely important for mother bears. It's just not important for like their wintertime survival, but the the um, the production of cubs and the the survival of cubs after mom gives birth because she's she's supporting her cubs in the den after after they're born on her body fat. She's nursing them during that time. She won't nurse uh, older cubs. So let's say for instance, Grazer goes into the den with all of her cubs this year. She's not going to be you know uh, nursing them with milk during the this winter. Uh, but first year cubs, when they're first born, they're in their first few weeks of life, they're active in the den. Mom can be awake during a lot of that process and she needs to be drawing energy from her body fat in order to produce milk to keep those cubs healthy before um, they and growing before they leave the den. Uh, a follow-up question to that is, uh, this, this last question is, how long is the gestation period for a sow that becomes pregnant? So again, uh, female bears go through this process called delayed implantation. So uh, they're the fertilized, uh, ovum don't implant in the uterus until she goes to her den. And the actual gestation process, once the implantation occurs, is actually really short. It's only about 45 days in brown bears. So brown bears are born in midwinter, right around like, uh, you know, anytime from like mid-January-ish to early February. So if you want to celebrate your favorite bear's birthday, anytime in that window is a good time to do it. Uh, so, so put it on your calendar if you want to say, you know, happy birthday to Otis or, or whatever. And, and speaking of Otis, Kim, um, a lot of people were, are, um, you know, asking questions maybe directly related to this or hinting at it. Um, somebody was wondering, do, does Otis have any documented offspring? And uh, another person asked, who is the oldest male um, that we've observed mating? Uh, so I don't know if you've heard any updates or, or not from talking to Ranger Michael, who's done some DNA analysis um, in the past at Brooks River, but we don't think or we don't we don't know if Otis has any uh, any offspring on the river. We just don't have the DNA evidence to support that. Is that your assumption as well from you know being at the river and talking with with Michael? Yeah, yeah, that that information is correct, and it, it remains the same. Um, I know that there were samples taken um, a couple years ago, and unfortunately, samples were lost. So we do not know who Otis has sired. Not yet, unless there's another. Um, research project that occurs. So we'll still be waiting. <laughs> and we'll try to get to just a couple more questions before we end our broadcast today. I do appreciate everyone's questions, even if uh, you know we can't get to them all. So I apologize for that. We just, uh, you know, running out of time. I think we could probably go another half hour at least just answering uh, questions. And somebody is wondering um, about, um, Yesterday, Kim, um, there was um, a meeting that we observed on um, on the cameras. Um, it took place just downstream of where you're standing on the edge of the lake. Uh, and somebody is asking Ranger Kim, do you know who 610's boyfriend was yesterday morning from that? I don't know if you had a chance to observe that at all or if you had a chance to talk with other Rangers and maybe have been able to pin an ID on that young adult male. I In, in the chat yesterday, I thought, you know, it kind of looked like 503, but that's definitely not 503 now that I looked at the footage. Uh, once again, it's just a bit too small. So this is them. I don't know if you have any any clues on, on uh, the male's identity. I unfortunately do not have a clue who that male might be. Um, we can ask around, though, and see if any of our rangers have an idea of who was mating with 610 yesterday. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to you with news if we find any, okay? <laughs> And one final question here, are, uh, are cubs ever identical twins? That's uh, a question I think also that we don't have an answer to, at least I can't remember reading any studies where that um, has, been, has been documented, where you know they, we've looked at two individual bears from the same litter, they looked at the DNA and they found, hey, it's, it's a perfect match, there's no variation in there. Um, so it, it, I think it's probably possible, uh, I, but it just hasn't, hasn't been documented. If it does happen, maybe it's, it's pretty rare overall, but sometimes we see siblings that look an awful lot alike. Uh, 
it's it's really really difficult to say. Kim, I don't know if you've come across any any other information on that. You know, through my read, I haven't found anything about identical twins in cubs either. Um, so, but definitely something that would be possible, but I haven't found any um, studies on it yet. Well, thanks to everybody for your questions. I know we, there was a ton submitted and we didn't get to them all, so I apologize for that, but I do really appreciate everyone sub submitting their questions. This has been uh, you know, a fun and, and interesting chat to, uh, to go over a lot of you know, it, you know, content, I think, that's very relevant to what we're seeing on the cameras right now. And of course, it extends to the, to the bears' um, activity year round. Because bears are, you know, they're only active to six to nine months each year in Katmai, but they get a lot done in that time. You know, they're extremely hungry animals, and that influences much of what they do. But given how profoundly bears feel hunger, if you see them foregoing a foraging opportunity to, see a, to seek out a mating opportunity, that really demonstrates just how powerful the urge uh, to mate can be. In the bears' mating season, it's filled with drama. Uh, but beyond that, it's one of the most vital times of the year for brown bears. It's a time of competition. It's a time of conflict. It's a window into their remarkable biology. And it provides a clear example of a process in which both male bears and female bears have something to gain and lose. And Kim, I wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us and uh, help us learn more about the brown bear mating season. Absolutely, thank you for having me. It's been, it's been fun to talk about the bears. <laughs> And my co-host for this live chat on Explore.org has been park ranger Kim Grossman at Katmai National Park, Alaska. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Thanks for watching today. And as we like to say at Explore, never stop learning.